Wow. Hello, welcome everyone. We'll wait a few more minutes as people are gathering. I'm Sarah Robertson and it's a, a huge honor to be here today. Thank you for inviting me. I'm a member of the Immigrant Rights Subcommittee, committee, which is a subcommittee of the Political Action Committee of the CPUSA. I'm also going to be introducing Jesus Jaime Diaz, who is also here as a presenter today. And Jesus is also a member of the Immigrant Rights Subcommittee. We'll wait a few more minutes before we get started. Thank you for joining us. Thank you everyone for joining us. You can go on. Okay, so we'll, we will go ahead and, and get started with our presentation now. Jesus will be will begin uh, with with um, why why we are here and he'll present an overview of our presentation. Just let me know, Jesus, when I should go to the next, next slide. slide. Next slide. So, buenos dias, good morning, everybody. Uh, the presentation. This is the overview, real quick. I'm going to be covering the first part, and my colleague Sara will be covering the, the, the second and third part. So, the first part. How did we get here? the making of the Mexico-U.S. border, answer some questions, some historical background of how the Mexico-U.S. border was created, socially constructed, I'll be it. Uh, the second part will be more militarization and humanitarian responses along the Mexico-U.S. border. And then we'll talk a little bit about solidarity and labor rights. So thank you, Sarita. Next slide. So real quick, uh, when we take a position in a, in a particular topic, I like to reference what I'm gonna do in this first part. So these are the six books that I'm gonna use, Occupied America, Mexicano Political Experience, Occupied Islam, Harvest of Empire, Crucible of Struggle, Manifest Destinies, and Viva la Raza. So there's the position I've taken, some of the authors that I'll be citing in this presentation, a good reference also for our viewers. Next slide, Sarita. So real quick, I wanna leave you with a real quick overview and a thought. The Mexico-U.S. border continues to be a quasi-militarized sphere of control by apparatuses of the federal U.S. government, such as the Department of Homeland Security and the Tenneco Border Patrol, Immigration Customs Enforcement, and at times heightened nativism of the U.S. military, such as the U.S. Army National Guard. Furthermore, problematically, rogue elements such as vigilantes, or what I call soldiers of fortune, and they take an oath of blind patriotism in hunting undocumented border crossers from Mexico and other parts of the Americas. So this first part of the class will interrogate the roots of the current status of the Mexico-U.S. border centered in the 21st century, as this is nothing that is new. The violence is nothing new. Uh, it will focus in chronological order on the social construction of the borderland, beginning with the Texas insurrection of 1835 to 1836, the imperialist war of aggression against Mexico, 1846-1848, and the Tratado de Mesilla, the Gatton Purchase, 1853 to 1854. Thereafter, further epochs of history leading into beyond 20th century that have demarcated the Mexico-U.S. border as was called back in World War I, a no man's land, uh, a metaphor. The objective of this class is to answer how do we get here? How do we respond? This is a history that demarcated the Mexico-U.S. border again as a no man's land. A question I want our audience to think about, what can be learned from a critical history? especially with the Mexican-American studied lens perspective, Chicano Chicano studies perspective, and the social construction of the border. And how can that assist them today struggle for social justice? Uh, our objective, again, answer, how do we get here? So before I start this presentation, I don't want it to come across as something nationalist. We have to understand the indigenous people that were slaughtered here in the Americas. It was the greatest genocide in human history. According to Gonzalez, an average of 1 million people perished annually for most part of the 16th century. So a lot of times we like to think about genocide in the Americas attributed to Latin America, the Spanish, and the United States very much the same, if not worse, same thing with Canada. Uh, for example, when Sanders also talks about the Spanish involuntary making of widow out of the Americas, the amount of people that were murdered and killed. 90% uh, of the na native population in the United States perished a century after the English landed at Plymouth Rock. So this is how you start creating borders and you start drawing nation states. Um, next slide, please. So I want to talk about the nation of Mexico because that's what borders us today to this very day and also what happened during the Mexican-American War. So real quick timeline, August 13, 1521, 
Hernán Cortés, to the Spanish conquistadors and native allies, defeat the Aztec people in the capital city of Tenochtitlan, present-day Mexico City. It's an occupation that lasts for approximately 300 years. September 16th of 1810, independence is drawn by Miguel Hidalgo Costillo, and insurrection ensues. Uh, for a decade, it's an armed conflict and political process, and secured the independence of Mexico as a nation state. It's important to look at that timeline because at the time, Mexico was very unstable. Um, what happened during that conflict for 10 years uh, was an underclass struggle in Mexico for independence. Uh, it was vehemently anti colonial. Uh, it succeeded in fostering Mexico's independence, but failed to extricate Mexico from the clutches of feudalism and emerging exploitive liberal capitalism and create a social revolution. So there was a lot of division still among Mexicans, class, race, slavery at a time, and so forth. But this has to understand within the context of what happens when it goes to war with the United States. Next slide, Senta. The first tension was, was called, we know now as Texas. At the time, it was called Coahuila, Texas. Uh, it existed from 1824 to 1835. Um, after 11 years of insurrection in Mexico, won its independence in 1821, as mentioned, from Spain. Yet, yeah, Mexico as an immersion nation state was plagued by regionalism and parochialism, inhibiting the emergence of the common identity. So there was a lot of fraction, a lot of division amongst the different people in Mexico. Uh, and Coahuila y Texas has little change for the small Mexicano population that numbered approximately, according to Armando Navarro, 2,240 in San Antonio, Goliad, Napodochi, San Victoria, and they were the main settlements in society. And they continued to be divided amongst two classes, the rich, the elites, and los pobres, the poor. Next slide, please, please. Sorry, So Mexico at the time of independence fractured as it was, I'll just kind of give you the, the baggage of it, the divisions among different various intersectionalities, um, understood that the Southwest what was the United States was vast, was very, very little populated, sparsely populated, actual word, um, and decided to invite Euro-American settlers to come into the lands and, occupy, and, and settle and become Mexican citizens. So they began to come. Uh, mainly into Texas. It happened in 1821. Uh, Spanish governor permitted Stephen Austin, you know the name Austin, Austin, Texas. Uh, he was a Missouri entrepreneur to settle some 300 Catholic families and formerly Spanish Louisiana in exchange for free land. Uh, so important about that was they were the, the settlers that came to Texas, they were supposed to be a good moral character, uh, develop the land and become Mexican citizens. Uh, they were supposed to be Roman Catholic as well and they were supposed to obey all Mexican law. So they were part of Mexico. They, they had taken an oath, they had become citizens of the Mexican public. But there was a problem with that. Um, the colonists from the US uh, had agreed to the conditions set forth by the Mexican government that all immigrants in Texas be Catholic. That was one, they didn't want that. What created the tension in Texas was they wanted slavery. When Mexico abolished slavery, it became a point of deep contention. That was a property. That was individual property. I felt like they were being imposed upon their individual liberties. So you start seeing the first conflict in regard to Anglo, Euro-American settlers, Texans, what later would be called, and Mexicans. Next slide, please, Sarita. There was also an ideology at the time uh, that existed within the Anglo-American identity, and that was manifest destiny. Um, Many of US uh, Americans view the concept of manifest destiny positively at the time as a shorthand reference to a period of history in the 1840s during which Americans unbound hunger for national growth uh, was satiated by the acquisition of the Oregon Territory, Texas, and the Mexican session of California as its jewel. What was this idea? It was to civilize those that were deemed as backward, Native American, Mexican, Native Indigenous, Mestizo, and so forth. Um, these were a cluster of ideas and they were embedded in on racism. This ideology also as well was used to uh, wage war against, and a war of aggression against Mexico. Uh, Euro-Americans believed they had the right to rule from sea to shine and sea and that was a God-given right given to them to do that. I wanna make sure you understand that ideology as we move forward into the next part. Next slide, please, Edita. So the Texas insurrection of 1835, 1836, um, this idea of what created the, the problems in Texas at the time. Uh, again, the resentment of abolishment of slavery, 
So it was decided to wage a war of so-called independence. Uh, I want to be really clear about this. It wasn't really independence because they were Mexican, they were Mexican citizens. Um, and it was a war about slavery. Uh, when Mexico abolished slavery in 1829, the slave owners here come into the law, they wanted to continue slavery in place. And a lot of these pictures, some of us grew up with, for example, that picture right there of Davy Crockett swinging and killing Mexicans. You see the breeding of hatred toward Mexican people. And Mexican people are racialized to this very day. But you see the animosity that came from that time, and it's something that people never forgot in the war cries, remember the Alamo, remember the Goliad. And so hence, you see the independence of Texas, what would be called Texas, and the Lone, Lone Star Republic, which the flag to this very day continues to be seen as that. Next uh, slide, please. Second. Battle of the Alamo, one of the most infamous battles uh, in the Mexican-American War, 1836. This was done actually against the filibusters, and I want to make really clear what a filibuster was as well, Corona Juan Gonzalez. Filibusters were actually a group of people in the 1800s that would come together, go into a country, and try to make donation. It was a way of gaining territory and the next territory. Um, the historical memory of this, uh, as it's remembered, is that the Euro-American fought bravely, they were slaughtered. Um, we need to understand what exactly happened during that time. Although inside the Alamo were white supremacists, they were slaveholders, adventurers who wanted to take land. The corn and Navarro, 180 filibusters died at the Alamo. Over Mexican, 400 or 500 Mexican soldiers killed during the siege. 1836, filibusters defeat the Mexican army at the Battle of Goliath. Now, some of you are wondering why is all this history so important in the creating of the border? Because you need to understand the violence in the border and how Mexican people and how a different nation would be viewed later on. Next slide, please, Serta. So the territorial dispute along the north has become one of the first points of contention um, with, in regard to manifest destiny. Um, the territorial dispute, so when Texas gains independence, you see in the map, the division was the Nueces River. Mexico said that's the division, and the United States said, no, it's the Rio, Rio Bravo, Rio Grande, now what they call it. And Mexico was provoked into a war. Uh, President Polk sent General Taylor down to the border, provoked the Mexican army to attack. And there you see a conflict erupt, uh, hence the Mexican-American War, as we know it, uh, the War of Aggression, U.S. Imperial Aggression in Mexico, 1846-1848. But I want you to realize this is what creates further chaos and conflict along the border with Texas and the way Mexicans are viewed historically uh, in epochs in history. Next slide, please, Erika. So the U.S. Imperial War Progression against Mexico, 1848, 1846-1848. Uh, Mexican Army was poorly equipped and trained. Mexico was no match for the United States in that conflict. The U.S. Army was predominantly made up of Texas volunteers who raped, pillaged, scalped, massacred uh, the mestizo and Indio civilian population. Churches were burned. It was a short war. About a year and a half, but it was a very, very violent war. And in the minds of many Texans, the objective was to get revenge for Texas, for the Alamo and so forth. So again, this ideology that becomes socially reproduced and how Mexicans are viewed in the United States and Texas, the borderlands, conflict, warfare, uh, brutality. Uh, so this need to guard against this enemy or so-called enemy. Next, uh, next slide, please, Erika. Early precursor to uh, to violence. So later on, I don't want to jump it too ahead. Uh, the kind of violence that would happen against Mexican America. One of the first examples happened in New Mexico. This is something that African American communities suffered greatly at the hands of, of, of settled colonialism, um, of slavery. Mexican American would come to, to endure something very similar. And I want to read this quote real quick. Um, the morning that this happened in Tao de Mexico. The morning of April 9th, 1847, was in many respects a typical day in Taos. That Friday, anything was ordinary. However, in this far northern American territory that the United States had recently invaded, and that day in 1847, the Americans executed six Mexican men for their roles on the attack of the highest ranking American civilian in the region. People were hung uh, and made an example out of. That's been consistent pattern in putting fear, some would say the fear of God into people, through violence. 
So you see this execution happen early on uh, against Mexican people, again, to subdue them, to control them, uh, and its violence is used uh, with their hung in public uh, by the US military. Next slide, click them. A few years ago, the People's World wrote a really good article. If you haven't read it, you should read it. It's on the San Patricio. The war was very unpopular in the United States by many people. And this probably this actually doesn't, it's not seen that way, but the San Patricio should be one of the first groups that should see, be seen as someone who challenged, a group of people who challenged whiteness and citizenship at the same time. So the San Patricio Battalion were a group of Irish immigrants from the United States who were in the army. They had just gotten from here, here from Europe. And they were against the war. They saw it as a violation of religion, of their faith, and of morality. And actually, they were going into Texas for mass, but they were full with for, um, for attending mass. So they ended up deserting little by little into the Mexican army, and they fought. They fought on the side of the Mexican army. Um, they were eventually captured after the Battle of Churubasco next to Mexico City. And again, this manifestation of violence. Uh, some of them that deserted before the war were branded with a D on their face, and 50 of them were hung when the Mexican flag came down and it was hung on the Castillo of Chapultepec to make an example out of us. So again, pe keeping people in place, understanding what's creating a border in regard to violence and, and terror. This is a form of terror, violence to control people and subdue them. So this sends an example also to immigrants coming into the United States of, of patriotism, of absolute blind patriotism. Um, but this execution is very, it's something that's been largely forgotten for the most part. So if any of you haven't read the, on people who you should look it up, some parties of people for. Next slide, please, Sarita. The Treaty of Guadalupe Hidalgo, the Tratado de Guadalupe Hidalgo. So to the old saying goes, the spoils of war, we can choose them. Uh, Mexico was forced to accept half of its nation. Uh, ceded, that's a nice word, it was taken. It, it, was, it was armed warfare, it was an invasion. Um, Rio Grande became the borderline that we know today between Texas and Mexico. Mexico lost the state, California, Arizona, New Mexico, Colorado, Utah, Nevada, and sections of other contentious states. Uh, the Treaty of Guadalupe Hidalgo was signed on February 2nd, 1848 to end hostilities. And something really important to mention about the Treaty of Guadalupe Hidalgo, the American government, the US American government, would suppress Article 10 of the Treaty of Guadalupe Hidalgo as it did not want to in any way intend to honor the grant of land made to Mexico and the city territories. So eventually Mexican people that own land, their lands were taken away, they were taken to court, taxes were raised, and they were really dispossessed of the land. Thus, they became strangers in their, in their own land. Uh, important to understand that because it's a form of injustice today. Sometimes people, especially in the South, would say the border didn't cross, we didn't cross the border, sorry. The border crossed us. That's where that saying actually comes from. And again, a creation of the border, a demarcation of people. You are a conquered people. You are less than, is the message you get in these, in these conflicts. Next uh, next slide, please, Arita. Hence, uh, 1850s, we're in, a, we're in Arizona now. So 1853, approximately, you see the gold rush happen in California. And you want to get access, easy access to California. The Mexican, the, the U.S. American government negotiates with the Mexican government to try to obtain further territory. Often we hear that it was the Gadsden Purchase. Some Mexican American scholars, Chicano scholars, have countered this. Um, Manifest Destiny did not stop uh, with the ramification of the Treaty of Guadalupe Hidalgo. The U.S. expansionist appetite became evident in 1853. The Tratado de Mesilla Gas and Purchase. And actually, the purchase was driven by four principles uh, and historical antagonisms. And I want to read them real quick to you. One, uh, the desire to acquire a more direct railroad route from Texas to California. That was one. Two, a security perspective. The U.S. was concerned about the volatility of the Mexico U.S. border, the positionality of it. Three, the U.S. had both economic and military concerns to obtain rights of transit across the isthmus of Tehuantepec, closer to the ocean, trading. And four, the U.S. desired to be released from the obligations of the Treaty of Guadalupe Hidalgo, Article 11, and this actually held the U.S. financially responsible and liable for native indigenous raids into Mexico. 
the U.S. pressured Mexico diplomatic and military into settling the Mexia. So again, now you see a different part of the border expand, which would be down to Tucson, right before Phoenix, the Gila River, and into New Mexico. And that's how you see that border created. Next slide, please. Sorry. As I mentioned earlier, and uh, I hope this isn't too graphic for some people with adults here, uh, institutionalized violence. So what happened to people inside the United States and Mexico and along the borderlands? Now, I've been redundant in history about the violence, but this is what violence breeds. That's why nothing is new on what we've seen on the border to this very day. Some people say, what's historical stuff? How does violence socially reproduce and become socially transmitted? Just like African Americans, just like Asian Americans in time from Chinatown to burn down, institutional violence would be a came of practice to terrorize a community, state sanctioned terrorism. Um, I'm gonna read this quote out of Juan Gonzalez real quick, powerful, and it speaks to how Mexicans were viewed and it's became common. The whole race of Mexicans become a useless commodity, being cheap, dog cheap, wrote the Corpus Christi correspondent for the Galveston Weekly News in 1855. 11 Mexicans that have stated have been found along the Nuestas in a hung up condition. Better so than to be left on the ground for the howling lobos to tear in pieces and then howl the more for the red peppers that burn inside the wrong. Common discourse in newspapers. Um, again, the little value in life, the devaluing of life, the disdain towards a group of people. Next slide, please, Erica. Uh, recently, and I encourage some of you to, to look this website up, refusing to forget, this has been a movement going on in the state of Texas recently. Uh, and this goes into the, the early 1900s uh, during the Mexican-American Revolution, where Mexicans were filled with impunity along the border. Recently in Texas, they have been putting up these road markers similar to what they do in Germany to remember those that died. A lot of people were killed in Texas along the border. Um, it was not common to find bodies lying in the desert, in the matorrales, in the brush, it was common to use this kind of violence against Mexican people. Um, again, the message was to keep you in a state of subservience and a state of terror, dispossession, and so forth. But even within that fear, we can't allow ourselves to be put We have to be able to resist with our humanity, with our dignity, and with our spirit for social justice, and as people continue to do this the very day. Next slide, please, Arita. So La Frontera, the border, some real quick, quick thoughts about it. U.S. Customs Service was established July 31st, 1889, renamed Customs and Border Protection March 1st, 2003. Uh, for a long time, they're the one that did the, the, the scouting, they're the one that actually conducted much of the work at the Border Patrol during the early 1900s and so forth. But the U.S. Border Patrol found March 26th, 1924, and eventually branched into the Department of Homeland Security November 25th, 2002. So La Frontera, the border, what does it mean to us when we look at it in terms of history? It continues to be a deep wound in the historical memory of a nation, of a people. It's a line of demarcation that is racialized. It doesn't just, when, whenever we hear anti-nativism or anti-Mexican rhetoric, you can be stuck in third generation, it's a racialized identity. That border is a racialized marker and it continues to do so to this very day. It is one of aggression. The border is one of aggression, animosity, and it's one of danger. The way people are interrogated when you go through the border, the way people are hunted down in the desert, the way we accept norms such as deterring through death, what the Border Patrol has created, and the violence. It's not a place where you go have a picnic or take a walk. It's a dangerous place. And as a community, uh, as a people, and nationally, not only internationally as well, we begin to solve there. We need to look at that dehumanization of people. How do we respond as a people to that dehumanization of the most vulnerable? We have a fetish for cheap labor, but we don't like to value the dignity of people. We like the cheap labor, but we don't like the value of the, the humanity of the people, how they contribute. We, don't value what they contribute to this country. And we understand that this economy is built on that, on, on that cheap labor. And until we find those answers, 
to making that change, we continue to reproduce whether well, it's not physical violence at times, but you have a symbolic violence in the way people are viewed, devalued, and we have to continue to persist. My colleagues, Harita, right I'm going to present about what is done on a humanitarian base, how people challenge what happens to try to make a difference and save people's lives in the border, because the actions are still present. This was the creation of the Mexico-U.S. border, that line of demarcation, that no man's land is what created it. I'm going to use a little bit of sense of humor real quick. Uh, a student of mine once said, why don't you all just get over the war? I go, it's not about the war. <laughs> no, no, one, no one argues against that. It's the way those prejudices, those stereotypes and that racism has continued generations after that conflict and how people continue to suffer. Not, not just from Mexico, because I don't want to make this just a Mexican thing. We have the Americas. We have the people from Guatemala that wars have created. That United States funded. In Guatemala, from El Salvador, from Nicaragua, risking their lives to that desert to cross. And again, we accept deterrence through death. If they die, if, if they want to come and they die out there, that's on them. And that's the mentality that the United States government to this very month carries. Okay, so with that, I will leave the next part of the presentation to my colleague, Sarita. That's it. Okay. So, and... and I will begin my presentation. Uh, Jesus, did you want to say anything about the border industrial complex? Um, no, it's fine. You can go for it. I'll, I'll, okay. I'll just say that, yeah, this is, a, this is a really good slide, too, because as Jesus was mentioning, it's, I mean, it's all about border industrial complex and, and expansion of that militarization of the border. Uh, the U.S., the federal government has issued $55 billion in contract, huge amounts of money, billions of dollars have been used to fund drones and intrusive biometric security. And I will talk more about that in my, in my um, presentation too. I wanna say this real quick before you go, sorry, Sarita. The importance of imperialism, what Comrade Lenin said, the border industrial complex, it's a business now. Monopolies rose out of the concentration at a very advantage of development. You have to understand how the border is a business now. And I apologize for not concluding on that. How many salaries are invested in the border for immigration? The amount of technology that's put into the border? And it's done at the expense of human suffering people. Again, to turn to death. We have to keep these ideas in mind. The monopolies, corporations, the amount of money invested. And again, this all comes from colonial practice. Okay, I don't want to take more time. Sorry. My presentation will center on border militarization and humanitarian responses. I'll just start out by saying because capitalism is a global system, the struggle of the working class and for socialism must be global. Unlike labor, capital moves freely across borders in most of the world in search of higher profits. And as we know, transnational corporations control many aspects of economic life. These range from financing to research and development, sources of supply, production, and labor. Exploitation of workers for profit is inherent in capitalism and causes or exacerbates all the major social and environmental ills of our times. Let's look at how this impacts immigration to the US. The North American Free Trade Agreement went into effect January 1, 1994. The freedom of movement it established for goods and services did not extend to labor. In fact, due to the inability to compete, many small farmers in Mexico and Central America were not able to sustain themselves due to devastating economic turmoil created by NAFTA and many, many headed north. The US immigration deterrence model, as, as Jesus had mentioned, uh, it's called prevention through deterrence. This was begun under Bill Clinton on October 1, 1994, the Clinton administration launched an effort to militarize the U.S.-Mexico border south of San Diego with Operation Gatekeeper, which installed more fencing and deployed additional border patrol agents. In 1995 came Operation Safeguard near Nogales, Arizona. This model of building more border walls, adding more border patrol agents and more surveillance and checkpoints on the roads, funnels migrants to cross in the most dangerous places and most inhospitable environments and reinforces racial, ethnic, national, 
and religious profiling. This was a deliberate and intentional policy. Border officials knew that death would be an element of this militarized enforcement only strategy. And their argument was that the threat of death would be a deterrent, that was so wrong. So in essence, the state has weaponized nature. Official border patrol statistics recorded 8,050 migrant deaths at the border from 1998 to 2020, an average of 365 deaths a year. More than 890 sets of human remains of US-Mexico border crossers were found in 2022. And that does not accurately reflect the numbers of people who die. According to community organizations and forensic anthropologists, the numbers represent a systemic undercounting of the number of missing and deceased migrants in the US-Mexico borderlands. Many remains are never found as they disintegrate quickly in the desert heat or are lost in the Rio Bravo. Some experts suggest it could be as many as 10 times higher. Why this policy under Clinton and the Democrats? The middle of these middle of the road Democrats worried about being outflanked by Republicans as soft on immigration enforcement, just as they had been portrayed as soft on crime in the 80s. This approach continues today, and now we see lives further endangered by Biden's asylum ban, which went into effect on May 12, 2023. According to Human Rights Watch, Biden's new plan combines elements from Trump's policies already found unlawful by two federal courts during the Trump administration. And by the way, the ACLU has initiated, initiated a lawsuit against Biden's new plan. The revamped asylum ban we see in place today will block asylum seekers at the border from entering the United States for five years unless they obtain an appointment through the cell phone application, CBP-1, or have been denied asylum in a country they already passed through. Appointments on the app are extremely limited and usually book up within minutes, meaning that asylum seekers wait for months, trying each day to secure a spot and often get separated from other family members. So the result here is electronic metering, forcing asylum seekers to wait in dangerous conditions along the border. 200 in fact are waiting in Nogales, Sonora on the Mexico side right now. I'm gonna pivot a little bit and talk some about humanitarian aid responses to migrant deaths along the US-Mexico border, specifically in the Southern Arizona desert. Migrant deaths occur all along the US-Mexico border in South Texas, New Mexico, California, and Arizona. And I'll speak primarily from my direct experience providing humanitarian aid in the Southern Arizona desert since 2001. Well, in 1999 to 2000, in, in that um, passing of, the, of that year, migrant deaths in Southern Arizona began to spike and in fact doubled. The community in Southern Arizona became aware of this as the media picked up on some of the stories and began to ask why, why are the bodies of migrants being found basically in our backyard? People of conscience and faith gathered in 2000 to brainstorm how we as a community could come together to prevent the deaths. And the first response was the group Humane Borders. Humane Borders puts out water in 55 gallon tanks, drinkable water in the desert near trails where migrants are known to cross. And it's marked with flat, they are all marked with blue flags, as you can see here. Deaths continue to rise, that is documented deaths. Um, we don't know how many actually were dying, are dying. By 2002, it was apparent that more needed to be done to prevent death and suffering. So the Tucson Samaritans formed, again, people of conscience, people of faith, uh, provided, uh, formed the organization to provide a human presence with volunteers actually providing medical assistance out in the desert. And of course, providing water and food uh, and socks and blankets, all of the things people need to, to prevent uh, death and suffering, and to restore a sense of dignity to those risking their lives to make the journey across the desert. And in fact, I was just out there a few days ago and we were providing food and water and, and medical assistance uh, to people along the wall. And uh, after we did that, uh, then two A-10s flew over, very low, probably, 
20 yards over our heads and 20 yards north of the border wall. So the militarization of the border is ongoing, intense, and we'll talk more about that in a minute. What you're seeing on the right-hand part of this slide are actually, they're called carpet slippers and, and migrants wear them to, uh, to get rid of the footprints because they're tracked by border patrol. Uh, this is the border wall near Sasabe, Arizona. So again, we were providing uh, humanitarian aid. We do that. Uh, trips go out every day and provide humanitarian aid to prevent death and suffering. So this is just a slide to show you what some of the environmental destruction looks like. This is Fresnal Peak, which is uh, several miles east of Sasabe, uh, in between Sasabe and Nogales, Arizona. And the, the, basically, the, the US government under Trump contracted with construction companies to build a road, to put a road and a wall through here. And they blew up the peak. It will never, it re will never get back to its natural state. So, so much environmental destruction has happened um, and nothing will be able, will ever be able to return to their the natural state and it affects animals uh, moving back and forth as well in their habitats Th these are slides of the border patrol challenging no more deaths volunteers and apprehending a migrant um, so no more deaths was formed in 2004 as a movement uh, and advocacy organization later uh, included advocacy as well as humanitarian aid 24-7 in migrant camps along the border in the desert. And as, uh, as the number of migrant human remains found increased yearly, in the, and so by 2005, 2006, 7, 8, it was more like 250 remains, 280 remains were found yearly uh, in this, along the Arizona border alone. And you can re also read about No More Deaths efforts to document abuse by Border Patrol, um, both while people are in custody and the use of lethal force. Uh, you can go to nomoredeaths.org, abuse documentation reports. These have been documented and published. Migrants face many medical risks. They are walking very fast at night with little food in steep mountainous terrain. You need at least a quart or a liter of water an hour to provide to prevent dehydration and heat illness. And when it's over 100 degrees, then people can uh, go on to kidney failure. Many people sprain or fracture ankles, leading to them being left behind by their group and guide. Blisters, nor normally not considered fatal, but they can be in the hot desert crossing when a migrant cannot keep up and is left behind. I just am reminded of a young woman who um, who slid and, and broke her ankle in a canyon and, and walked out on her knees, thankfully was able to find the road and, and flag down help, but um, situations like this happen so often. Okay, militarization of the borderlands. This is, this is showing an Elbeek, Systems of America surveillance tower in Southern Arizona, which there are at least 55 along the border. The US Customs and Border Protection are aggressively expanding a virtual wall of border surveillance towers in the Southwest. And next we'll look at a map put out by EFF, that's the Electronic Frontier Foundation. You can go to their website and check this out, but many new towers have been built all along the U.S.-Mexico border, so not just in Arizona, though Arizona was an early adopter of surveillance towers uh, launched in the early 2000s, and now there are uh, hundreds, 352 towers in California, Arizona, New Mexico, and Texas, um, and this, is being, this map is being updated all the time as more towers are being built. Um, they are pushing to integrate the surveillance systems into all one system that would bring the LBEAT system and general dynamic systems and Andrew systems under one specific program. LBEAT is also the company, it's an Israeli company that builds towers in Palestine, surveillance towers there. 
So I'll just say a few, uh, a few more words about the surveillance towers. Um, there's research done by the University of Arizona School of Geography. Sam Chambers, a researcher, and also Jeffrey Boyce and Sarah Lanius are two of the other researchers on this study. They analyzed the spatial and temporal patterns of border crossers and the mortality of these crossers in comparison to border surveillance in place. And the research shows a cor definite correlation between surveillance towers and migrant deaths. Surveillance towers force migrants to take a different route, which is often more dangerous due to the weather and geography. So it's causing more people to die, more migrants to die. And I, before we uh, jump into this slide, what can we do? We're, uh, I'm, I'll just say a few more things. Uh, U.S. Border Control singles out indigenous, dark-skinned Latino families and Black communities involving, the, including those in transit or residing in the U.S.-Mexico border region, making them the explicit target of surveillance and enforcement. And to add, Haitian refugees have been especially impacted, 30,000 deported from the U.S. in 2021 without being allowed access to the asylum court process. So as we see, historical racism, forced displacement for economic or climate reasons, and genocide throughout the Americas are the root causes of the growing involuntary migration of indigenous peoples. Indigenous peoples experience differentiated violence at the border, and they are often the target of racial discrimination at the hands of U.S. border agents and government officials. And we, saw, we see this specifically in the arrest and detention and charging of Oatam, Native Oatam protesters against the wall. Uh, that was in September 2020 in Oregon Pipe National Monument. Uh, sacred lands of the Oatam were being desecrated by the building of the border road and border wall. Um, two women protesters, Oatam protesters, were arrested and charged and had to face going to court um, uh, to fight those charges. And also, just Thursday evening, an, a Tohono O'odham man was killed, shot and killed by Border Patrol uh, near Loopville. He lives on the. He is a U.S. citizen living in his community on the U.S.-Mexico border. He was shot and killed. His name is Raymond Matias. What can we do? So assess all border laws, policies, and procedures to ensure the centrality of human rights. So this is key. And this idea is also being uh, put out by uh, the National Network for Immigrant and Refugee Rights, their recent report called Spotlight on the Border. Ensure migrants and asylum seekers have immediate access to protection, shelter, and safety at the border, including access to services, asylum, and due process. And the militarization of immigration enforcement, which is fueling the crisis of migrant deaths and disappearances, and, and the destruction of indigenous people's lands and culture. And pushbacks at the border. This practice pushes migrants into vulnerable situations and subjects them to exploitation, discrimination, and violence in transit in the transit countries. save lives and establish coordinated international efforts on the crisis of missing migrants by supporting and implementing objective aid of the Global Compact for Migration. This objective encourages an enhanced international collaboration to prevent migrant deaths, identify the dead, and locate the missing. Because as, as we know, this is happening globally, not just in, along the southern Arizona or, or the U.S.-Mexico borderlands. And the criminalization and prosecution of people in situations of vulnerability, especially migrants and asylum seekers. This would mean ending all forms of immigrant incarceration and ensuring right-centered community-based non-custodial alternatives to detention. Ending en masse prosecutions, which has in the past been called Operation Stre Streamline. This undermines due process rights and other constitutional protections and the costly criminal prosecution of unlawful entry into the U.S. by repealing criminal penalties for unauthorized entry and re-entry. That would mean amending the Immigration and Nationality Act to repeal 8 U.S.C. 1325 and 1326. 
which criminalizes migrants. And that's still being used to this day. Uh, the en masse prosecutions haven't started back up, but it's possible they will under this new asylum ban. Ban for-profit federal prisons contracted by the Department of Justice. Um, and many other ways of ending criminalization and prosecution of people and, and my, of migrants and asylum seekers. So as, a, as people who can try to influence legislators, we can pass, work towards passing inclusive and rights affirming legislation, officially recognizing the rights of migrants, asylum seekers, and those with temporary protected status such as DACA, or Deferred Action for Childhood Arrivals, TPS recipients. Uh, but we need to pass broad, inclusive, rights-affirming legislation to regularize status of migrants residing in the U.S. And any regulariz regularization program must recognize full worker protections, including the flexibility to remain, leave, return, settle, and be joined by family members, and meaningful participation in civic life. And as we know right now, we, there is not legislation that, that does that. So um, let's move on to something that has happened recently. And this was, um, and Steve Valencia, our, our comrade, has been super involved and working hard on this project through Jobs with Justice to support the rights of all immigrant workers through working with organized labor to be allies um, in the effort to um, to document when non-citizen workers are victims of or witnesses to labor rights violations. So there is now an, a streamlined and expedited process to where people can get deferred action status. And this, this is a very temporary status. It can be uh, provided for two years. It's like uh, deferred action for childhood arrivals, only deferred action based on people being victims of labor violations or witnesses to labor violations. And so in January of this year, the, the Department of Labor uh, and Department of Homeland Security working together, they released um, a new process. They notified uh, the public and released a new process whereby people who are non-citizen workers um, can go forward with complaining about labor-related violations and potentially get, that is the process is now streamlined, potentially get deferred action status. So, and again, this is temp a temporary status. It doesn't provide a pathway to citizenship, um, but the process has been made more streamlined and easier um, uh, through work, through the efforts of many, um, immigrant workers, their courageous whistleblowing who risk their livelihoods to confront deceitful employers. One example is the example of Unforgettable Coatings Incorporated. This is a commercial painting corporation that operates in many states. This company unlawfully took millions of dollars from its workers and even used their immigration status to discourage them from reporting the abuses and to obstruct an official investigation. However, the Department of Labor was able to pursue a federal case against the company for violating minimum wage laws, and they ultimately settled the case for $3 million, thanks to the courageous immigrant workers who risked everything to expose labor violations. And as I'll just say one more thing about this, that there is much more work to be done because ultimately uh, there is a campaign to work towards workers getting U visas based on common crimes committed by employers on workers during labor disputes. So this is called the power campaign. And so this would make it uh, much more of an organizing campaign for workers uh, to get involved with and, and allies and labor unions to, to work together to hopefully get this um, advocacy piece also um, into law and with a streamlined process for people to get U visas. Uh, based on these crimes committed against them by employers. So we're almost to the end here. This slide we created to remember those killed on the borderlands. And as Jesus mentioned, uh, the institutionalized violence 
the targeted violence, racialized, uh, racialized violence. Um, many people have died at the hands of the Border Patrol. In fact, 265 fatal encounters just since, since 2010. That includes the use of lethal force by Border Patrol agents. It also includes vehicle collisions that were forced by Border Patrol, Border Patrol chasing vehicles, running them off the road, putting spikes in the road, people having more, uh, extremely violent, uh, dangerous uh, motor vehicle accidents that cause deaths, and also lack of providing medical attention, adequate medical attention for people in custody of Border Patrol. So um, I think um, before, I, before I read the names, I just want to read one quote from scholar activist Harsha Walia and Todd Miller, a quote from his book, Empire of Borders. Scholar activist Harsha Walia writes, in order to rid ourselves of border imperialism, along with the barriers we erect within ourselves against one another, our movements have to supplant the colonial and bordered logic of the state itself. Todd Miller goes on to say, what is required of humanity today is immense and powerful creativity, which requires making new relationships that offer new possibilities and borders inhibit the ability to do that. I'm going to say the names of, of those who are listed on this slide and adding two more who are more recent. And after each name, please feel free to say presente. Carlos La Madrid, presente. Ramses Barron Torres, presente. Victor Santillan de la Cruz, presente. Jorge Solis Palma, presente. Sergio Adrián Hernández Huereca, presente. Anastasio Hernández Rojas, presente. Silvano Gracia, presente. Leandro Villarreal, presente. Jerónimo García, presente. Dionisio Maldonado, presente. Crescencio Oliveira, Jr., presente. Vicente Aguilar, presente. Jesús Bazán, presente. Antonio Longoria, presente. Byron Sosa Orellana, presente. Juan Pablo Pérez Santillán, presente. Guillermo Arrevalo Pedrosa, presente. José Antonio Elena Rodríguez, presente. Valeria Unique. Tachiquín Avarado, presente. José Luis Arámbula, presente. Claudia Patricia Gómez González, presente. Carmelo Cruz Marcos, presente. Abigail Román Aguilar, presente. Diosmani Ramos. Laurencio, presente. And Raymond Matias, presente. Now I'm going to pass it back over to Jesus to speak a little bit about the Corrida de Dionisio Maldonado. Thank you. Gracias, Sarita, for that. Uh, so we were going to play a corrido for you uh, due to technological difficulties. We weren't able to do it, but real quick, this is a corrido of Dionisio Maldonado. Sarita mentioned the name. We have to understand the violence on the border. As I mentioned, what creates violence, what reproduces violence. So Dionisio Maldonado, along with Vicente Oliveira and Vicente Aguilar, were murdered near Bruni, Texas on April 1st, 1920, uh, as they were riding their horses near a watering communal spot, hole, a watering hole. Uh, they were murdered by Texas Rangers and Customs Officers. Um, sad, uh, 
one of the gentlemen that I was reading doing the historical archival research on it, because since Oliveira, they actually found a wedding dress on the horse. Um, he was going to be married. They were accused of being bootleggers at the time, tequileros, which was not true. The premise of the story, 100 years later, October 15, 2022, in San Diego, Texas, uh, the families came together. Uh, the mayor from Parra, Nuevo Leon, Mexico, came. Uh, there are the pictures of the, the great granddaughters. They played the corrido. Uh, the families cried. The loss of, of life, the loss of innocent life, that continues to this very day, 100 years later. And when will it stop? How do we deconstruct the violence on the border? How do we stop from viewing the darker as a menace? Well, it's drugs. It's drugs that will then stop the damn need for it in this country. But like Comrade Lenin said, you know, we have to be mindful of corporations, las corporaciones. It's all from a colonial legacy. They've created an economy around the border that they can't pull out from because it has salaries, it has paychecks, it has retirement, it has investment, it has the drones, it has weapons, it has vehicles, it has something. How do we begin to deconstruct that? How do we begin to see maybe borders similar to the European Union? That's not the best model, but maybe something similar. So anyhow, the corrido is a very passionate corrido because it's the heart of Mexican culture. It tells you a story. And again, the story, a cry from the past about the need to end violence. But at the same time, we have to fight with whatever means possible in this capitalist society, predatory capitalist society, to save lives, to save the lives of the vulnerable, the charter economic refugees that come to this country to work. And I don't like using that, that narrative at, at all times because you know what, there is, antagonisms, external antagonisms that create migration. And a lot, of, a lot of times, it's our own involvement, the US government's involvement in other countries that has created that immigration. So on behalf of the Immigrant Rights Subcommittee uh, for Political Action CPUSA, me and Sarita, we thank you for joining us today for this presentation. And I encourage you to, you're gonna get the recording of this corrido, but I encourage you to listen to it, powerful corrido. Again, no more deaths. We should not accept one more casualty and we should not accept that as a norm and the violence of perpetuated by it. Muchas gracias, compañeras, compañeros. An honor to be with all of you today on this argument, or evening in the East Coast. And now I think we'll move into the question and answer time. If anyone has questions, um, and, and our moderator will be Luke to moderate the Q&A. Thank you. That's it. Luke? Luke? Okay. Um, just a moment. Okay, we're op opening the, uh, the, the uh, facilitators have indicated that we can open the floor for discussion now. So if you'd like to introduce a question or um, make a comment, please uh, indicate you want to do so by clicking the picture of the hand, and then we'll scroll through the attendee list and we'll call your name. But at the same time you click the picture of the hand, you may as well go on and click the picture of the mic on your end so that when we open up on our end, you're ready to, to speak. So I'm looking, I'm scrolling through now, looking for raised hands. Karamu, Karamu opening your, oh, okay, you're set. Um, question? Okay. Um, do you think that, um, and I've read some places about Mexican, the Mexican War. Do you think that um, that part of this is a legacy? The violence is the legacy of the war, and just like there's a legacy of slavery, or are the two connected? Okay, thank you. Uh, let us take a few more comments and questions. Uh, is that okay with the facilitators that we collect? Yes. Okay. okay, thank you. All right, Jonas, I'm opening your mic on our end. 
open your mic on your end, please, Jonas. There you are. Hello, thank you. Uh, it's actually pronounced Jonas. <laughs> Sorry. Um, but I, I actually just wanted to thank you for the presentation. Uh, it's just a history that's not often overlooked in, in this country. Um, and it, a lot of times when we talk about it, uh, it's very eye opening to people who don't know about this kind of history. So uh, I, I, I've had a very complicated, as, as all immigrants do, we all we have a very complicated upbringing. Uh, my parents are from Mexico, but I grew up here. Uh, and then one of my uncles started working for us. So, <laughs> so, that, so that's fun. But um, it, it's a very complicated and, and dark history. And uh, like I said, it's very often overlooked. So I just wanted to thank you for bringing attention to it. Um, the, the party's analysis on border violence and uh, Hispanic Americans is the reason I joined, uh, because no other political party specifically talked about it. Uh, so uh, yeah, and um, just a bit of news. Uh, there was an accident here in Oregon uh, where a semi-driver uh, hit a, a van transporting um, immigrant labor back home. Uh, 11 people were injured, uh, were in the vehicle, and seven of them passed away, uh, sadly. So, uh, so yeah, so we're dealing with that. But uh, again, thank you for the presentation. I really appreciate it. It's important things. It's important stuff that we need to know about uh, this country's history. And, uh, thank you. Thank you. Looking for other raised hands. Darren, your mic is open on our end. Please open. There you are. There you are, Darren. Speak up, please. We can't hear you yet, Darren. Darren Arnold. OK, your mic is open, but for some reason we don't hear you. Sorry. OK, Carla, opening your mic. Carla, there you are. Hello, are you able to hear me? Yes. Yes. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, I want to thank both of the panelists for the work that you are doing and for your uh, poignant presentation today. Uh, I uh, have a question. I am a, I am a Chicana uh, trans woman. My mother is from a town called Brownsville on the US-Mexican border in uh, what's now South Texas. And my family has been there since the 1600s. I have uh, been there. I've uh, been there uh, only a few times, and I understand it is a very violent uh, part of the world, and a very uh, hostile part of the world in terms of white supremacist uh, violence. But my question uh, today is: um, I, I've noticed a very disturbing trend amongst uh, some Latin Latinos and some people, like in my family, who have been there since the 1600s, uh, internalize some xenophobic uh, rhetoric and nativist ideas from the Trump movement. And I'm wondering if you have any advice about how to combat uh, xenophobic attitudes and anti-immigrant attitudes amongst uh, Latinos, especially Latinos who have been able to carve out uh, a life for themselves in uh, the middle class. Uh, thank you very much for your important work on this issue. This is also one of the reasons for my uh, joining uh, the party. Um, uh, thank you. Okay, uh, Sarah and Jesus, uh, let's turn it back to you. And once you complete responding to this set of questions, we should have enough time to open the floor again. Okay. Okay, I'm gonna respond to the first one real quick. Um, the legacy of war, is it similar to that of slavery? You better damn right believe it. It's, it, it's a racialization. But I think the most problematic thing about that, it's a justification to mistreat people. We imagine, we always have to have a boogeyman. We always have to have an enemy to justify investment of capital into whatever it is, whether it's war, whether it's border, border surveillance, whatever it is, prison industrial complex. You have to justify, just like back in the day in the medieval time, God's will, there has to be a reason to mistreat people. And I think it's ramped up, it's ramped up. Um, it is a legacy of, of the war, but it's, it's, it's more created and more fabricated to justify the mistreatment of people. Sarita? Yeah, I think, I, I mean, I agree totally with that. Uh, it is a legacy um, of the war as, 
as um, as the legacy of slavery um, is also with us to today, to today, right? So I think we have to really think in terms of that and educate educate the people. I mean, I think we have to put this message out widely and and think about building coalitions and and bringing that message out uh, as broadly as we can. I think that's what I have to say. Yeah, thank thank you for that question. Yeah, gracias. Uh, second thought, uh, a colleague from, uh, from, that derives from family origin from Texas, uh, talked about xenophobic attitudes and internalized depression. You know, there's a saying, just because you're my skin does not mean you're my kinfolk. It really resonates in history. Uh, for that particular region of the United States, I've spent time in Texas as well. Um, I kind of mentioned a little bit about the violence that occurred there. So there was a common saying that even to this very day continues in the Southwest, anything but Mexican. So to be terrorized and kept away from your culture, from your identity, from your language, you're going to internalize those messages and they're going to socially reproduce in time if you're not educated about it. Um, history is always effective. It's always really effective to question, to ask, as opposed to challenge. Uh, that's always really effective. Why do you feel this way? Where does it derive from? Where does it come from? And try to keep a dialogue going, because if you challenge it, it's going to be reactionary. Um, and it gets ugly sometimes, and particularly with family. So if you value that relationship, it's better just try to ask as opposed to challenge or confront. It's not something that's easy to go up against. Uh, I think we all face it in our families, friends, uh, and so forth in our communities. So just always ask, why, why do you feel about this? Where does, and then where does it come from? That, that would be my advice to you. Sarita? Thank you, Jesus. Yeah, I, I don't think I really have anything more to add on that, except I do want to confirm that there is white supremacist violence out there, definitely uh, all along the border wall here in Arizona, in Southern Arizona. So there, just a few days ago, there were there was a carload of people identifying as Proud Boys, and so um, and they do uh, they sort of like round up immigrants, migrants, people seeking asylum and hold them in for the border patrol. So that's um, that's definitely still an ongoing issue. So it's it's not just state violence, but it's also uh, white nationalist or white supremacist violence ongoing um, that we have to figure out how to counter. Um, but I, I agree with Jesus's approach, uh, ask why, why do you feel this way and um, getting people to reflect deeply on that and and maybe figure out that they can come from a different place about the, about these about this okay thank you okay would you uh are, are you uh would you like to take a few more comments and questions yeah we'll take them dude okay sure all right so beck i'm opening your mic your mic is open on up uh, there you are Yes, hi, um, thank you for the presentation. I was just curious because um, I have done, I mean, not very extensive, but some reading into the, um, the additional vulnerability of South and Central American indigenous migrants at the border, um, particularly linguistically. And I was curious if any of the work that you've done has um, highlighted um, those populations and i am curious um a lot of the activism involves spanish obviously because the majority of um, migrants coming from the southern border you know speak spanish but i'm interested if you've worked with other materials like in um like maybe like some maya languages or quechua uh, because that's something that i had um read about previously and was curious about your perspective on thank you is, was that clear? Was that question clear to you? I didn't. It, it, I wasn't. I, I wasn't clear to me. I didn't catch it. Kind of broke up. Beck, Beck, could you um, restate your question? I didn't catch it either. Mm -hmm. Did you, Sarah? Um, somewhat. Yes. I. I mean, I think I caught it somewhat. Yeah. But um, the Beck, question was maybe I'll restate it, and you can say whether this is correct. Or, um, your concern is about the additional vulnerability uh, experienced by South American and Central American migrants. Um, and if any of our work has 
uh, been centered on that or highlighted that uh, that we know of. Is there more to the question than that? Uh, yes, sorry for the, um, sorry it wasn't clear. Specifically with um, like migrants from indigenous populations who maybe don't speak Spanish or have been additionally marginalized by um, Mexican governments or local governments in their home country, since that adds that additional uh, layer, particularly for those that don't speak Spanish. Yeah, thank you. I can I can address that somewhat. And, and the, the way I would address that is that, yes, there are people, there are uh, immigrant rights activists working actively working on this uh, additional layer or additional um, vulnerability that indigenous migrants experience. For example, I have my colleague, uh, Blake Gentry, is um, has done a lot of work. Uh, he's with the Alianza, Alianza Indigena, or Indigenous Alliance, and he uh, and other colleagues worked hard and with the with much input from indigenous migrants, immigrants themselves, um, on um, creating a medical uh, guide, medical document that um, helps uh, medical providers who are treating immigrant uh, migrants, I mean, indigenous migrants and, and immigrants. Um, and so it's in various languages. So uh, including um, Mom and Kiche and Ishil, many indigenous Mayan languages of Central America, of Guatemala specifically. Um, and so I, I know that there is work being done to specifically um, alleviate that vulnerability in the ways that that activists can. Uh, but I think that people do really experience a, a much higher level of racialized violence because uh, they uh, their language is not their first language is not Spanish. They may speak some Spanish, but uh, for that reason, uh, they don't often don't understand. Or, or have, they don't understand when their rights are explained to them, uh, let's say by a border patrol agent, if they explain their rights. So the language gap is there. And then, um, and there's not always a translator providing their language. And another example is Operation Streamline, which I mentioned, which is the en masse prosecutions, criminalization of migrants, uh, just for so-called illegal entry or illegal reentry. And so during that, um, People would people's first language may not be Spanish, maybe a Mayan language, or as you mentioned, Quechua, uh, or another indigenous language from South America. And so, um, people again don't. It's hard for people to to fully understand. Even if they speak a little bit of Spanish, then the court thinks, oh, they understand their rights as explained to them. Well, not necessarily so, because Spanish is a second or maybe third language for them. So yes, I agree. There is a much heightened vulnerability for indigenous migrants, um, and, and as far as, and I'm sure heightened racism against them by agents too. Um, but I think I'll pass it over to Jesus to to make some comments about. I'll this. make a thought. You know, I haven't worked in, within that spectrum, but I'll make this comment. And this is documented in a book called Christians and Gringos: uh, Latino Law and the Imagination. It's uh, by Stephen Bender, an attorney out of a Seattle University, and your comment's really important. And actually, we need heightened vigilance on that because back in the 90s, I'm from Oregon, somebody mentioned Oregon, uh, sadly, tragedy over there. Um, there was a person from Oaxaca detained and they didn't speak Spanish, they didn't speak English. So they thought this person was crazy and they detained him. They kept him in jail for over a year. They thought he was insane. So that's an example of the importance of being responsive to these issues. Uh, the mistreatment of indigenous people also through Mexico is brutal. It's brutal right away, the dialect, language, they catch it, and discrimination. Uh, so no, thank you for that comment and the need to us to require heightened vigilance in regards to people that come from Native Indigenous background from the Americas. Thank you. Okay, we have a few more hands. Uh, Rebecca, I'm opening your mic. Rebecca? Rebecca? Um, yeah, can you hear me? Yes. Okay. Um, thank you guys for your time. Um, I just wanted to ask what 
your thoughts are on the current rhetoric going on between the U.S. and Mexican government, um, specifically the Republican Party kind of ramping up this idea of putting boots on the ground into Mexico um, to this point that AMLO has even felt the need to publicly publicly address that kind of um, more violent rhetoric. Is this actually a threat, do you guys think, or is this more like political grandstanding um, in the wake of the next election cycle coming up? Okay. Um... You want to take you want to uh, take that first, Jesus? Do you have any thoughts? Well, okay. let's. Okay. There's there's one more one. I saw one more hand. It was a Matthew. And I'm looking. Is that Matthew Powell? Are you still interested? Okay, let me unmute this person. Okay, Matthew. Matthew did you uh, have no. your? Um, no, I don't have a question anymore. Someone else asked it already, but thank you. Okay. Like that. All right. So this is your last. Let me scroll through and see if there's anything else. Uh, let's see if we can get Darren. Darren, uh, I'm, there you are. Can you hear me? Yes. Okay, thank you. It was a technical issue. Appreciate this. Um, yeah, uh, I live in Missouri. You could argue probably the most central part uh, of the country, arguably the most removed from the physical border. Um, and so when it comes to the issue of immigration here politically, it's kind of just used as a social grandstanding point, especially by our Republicans. Um, and I was wondering, the question is, if there is kind of a historic movement that we could kind of draw upon for people more central in the United States, more uh, removed from the physical border, that we can use to study and learn from to kind of establish or reestablish or whatever we need to do, uh, that network of support and solidarity for those closer to the border doing the on the ground work for migrants uh, trying to come into the country. Yeah. Okay, Thank turning the floor back over to Jesus and, and Sarah. And you can also include your any any closing remarks you'd like to make. You have the floor. Thank okay. you. Go ahead. Hey, Jesus, do you want to go first? Or yeah, me... so oh. the thoughts on the current rhetoric by Republicans. Um, I don't like to live in a life of uh, fear, uh, but let's not forget the occupation of Veracruz and not forget the punitive expedition in the early 1900s. Those things really happened. But I think in contemporary times, uh, with the elections coming up, again, it's this disdain toward Mexican people. They're the enemy. We can bully them. They're a problem. We can use our American, U.S. American exceptionalism, our chauvinism. And again, that, 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 that actually exacerbates racism and prejudice and discrimination. It's always on the surface in the United States. So I, I would say that that's what it is, more rhetoric than ever. But it never, never don't think that it can't happen. Never put that to the side and imagine it can't happen because it can. But I wouldn't live in a fear that, it, that, that that's what's going to happen, my personal opinion. Um, again, our colleague about being removed from the border, how do we raise awareness? We, we need to educate ourselves on these issues. That's one. Um, we need to take an active engagement in understanding how history connects to the present. That's one of the main things. Because one of the most biggest problems we have in the United States is historical amnesia. They were never taught history, a history that's critical, history that makes us understand why, who benefited, what was provoked, who caused it. It's always a real clear master narrative in the way we think, the way we're socialized and conditioned in our school experience. It's actively engaging in grassroots organizations, connecting, you're connected with the party, that's one thing, seeking out different venues that are active, border angels, Samaritans, no more deads, different organizations that are active on the border uh, and folks that, that, that actually conduct awareness in the community. I, I go, those are your main resources, your main sources to, to turn to. Thank you for your questions. Sarita? Yeah, thank you for these great questions. So I think uh, the question are, uh, is that rhetoric, the boots on the ground talk uh, from the Republicans? I, I think it is to large, in large part, 
kind of political grandstanding or political rec uh, rhetoric in anticipation of the next election. But I think it could also, as Jesus mentioned, it could also become something else. They are speaking about creating processing centers in um, Guatemala and I believe in, in a couple of other um, locations in Central America and, poss and possibly in Colombia. Uh, because many immigrants are arriving now seeking asylum from Colombia. Um, so I think that, that, yeah, I think we'll have to keep really aware and see what these processing centers are turning out to be. Is, is it more like boots on the ground of militarization and um, uh, another piece of militarizing the border, or is it actually a way of assisting people to to apply for asylum, to get asylum. As we know, in Colombia, there are many issues with imperialism affecting the politics there, as in Cuba and Nicaragua. Uh, I, on the other question, um, the, is there a historic movement in the US um, where we could look at that and, and help us figure out how to establish a network of solidarity in other states other than along the US-Mexico border. I think we can look at the at the civil rights movement, right? So uh, I think that was, um, I mean, on the ground, much of it played out in the South and and yet people, eventually the movement built to the point where people around the country did join in in that movement and came to the South and worked in that movement. So I think that's a possibility to, um, to look at that potentially as a historic movement in US history where um, that connection could be made. And those, that's, those are sort of my thoughts there. Um, I don't know if, if, Jesus, if you have any more thoughts along that line. Um, uh, in any case, yeah, that's a great question. We need to think about that much more. Um, and I thank you for that question. I would just say as in closing remarks that I think building coalitions is always important. So reaching out to um, all of the allies that we can, so labor and immigrant uh, rights organizations, people. Um, so, so there are organizations in the middle of, of the US for example, in Iowa, right, there's um, their immigrant rights coalitions and um, statewide immigrant uh, organizations organized by immigrants. And so listening to immigrant voices, uh, migrant voices, but also immigrants who are long established in the US, um, reaching out to those organizations and listening to their, uh, their needs and, and what they think, uh, what direction we should take in order to build coalitions better and especially in anticipation of the next election, right? So um, with every election, there is a lot of uh, hate. Me media puts out a lot of hate, a lot of hate talk. So for example, one coalition that we've built here in Southern Arizona is called Stop the Hate Collective. And this collective is specifically doing outreach to uh, bring public awareness about hate messaging in electoral campaigns. So we know we saw lots of that in the previous election, 2022, and we'll see lots of it in 2024. Um, so we're, we're asking people, organizations and individuals to sign a pledge to stop the hate, basically a collective. Uh, we work as a collective with many organizations involved. And so yeah, you can go to stopthehate.org and, and see that pledge and sign on. And so I think um, a lot of, especially Republicans, have put out um, really hateful rhetoric during uh, to the media and, and part of their campaign um, in in the previous election, and they will continue to do so. And it'll be racist. It'll be uh, hateful, and will will raise uh, you know will get other people to follow them. So we need to counter that with this stop the hate pledge and stop the hate type work. So that kind of work could be um, ongoing, I think, around the country too. Um, I think there are many organizations that could get on board with that kind of that kind of coalition building. 
I guess I will I will just end my remarks there unless there are other questions that um, or, or Jesus if you have any other ending remarks. Thank you very much to all of you for attending. So real quick, just I want to I want to back what Sarita was saying. One of our colleagues said when he talked about legacies, you know, once there was a legacy of uh, God wills it to do away with infidels. This is going way back in medieval times. We have to neutralize the justification for hate and for racism and the dehumanization of people. That should be our core, one of our core struggles. And would there be educating our communities? Sometimes my students will say, well, what can I do? I can't change the world. Well, well then maybe you can, you know, theoretically, but, but you can make a difference in people's life and how they think, and you can start that chain reaction to change the world. So thank you very much, everyone, for joining us for this presentation. We appreciate your time and your presence today. That's it. Okay, thank you, thank you uh, Sarah. Thank you, Jesus. Okay. Uh, uh, and thank you everyone for participating. We hope you'll join us for the rest of the series. The next class uh, uh, will be held Tuesday night, uh, 7.30 to 9 p.m. Eastern, and also Thursday night, 7.30 to 9 p.m. Eastern. And the topic will be ever the ever important uh, 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 topic of Marxist uh, economics. So. Thank you, Sarah. Thank you, Jesus. And thank you, thank everyone, you. for you. taking time to uh, make this day uh, a, a great start of our effort to reground ourselves in uh, the uh, uh, strategy, tactics, goals of uh, the party in building, contributing to building the working class movement in this country. So thank you. Awesome. very much thank have you. a good rest of your weekend hope you can get some rest thank you bye-bye bye-bye